Weatherby Flowers, who is a community engagement coordinator at the Madison Public Library. Although you may know her because she's been an organizer of Madison's Juneteenth event, uh, a role she's had for over 30 years. And she's also organized other events in this community. She was named one of Wisconsin's 51 most influential black leaders by Madison 365. And when I emailed her about partnering with us on this event, she jumped at the chance. And it's because of that, that we are so grateful um, because this event wouldn't be uh, possible otherwise. Annie. <clears throat> well, Harambe, I like to say that as Kiswahili for pulling together. It is one of the themes that we use for Juneteenth. But on behalf of the library, uh, I welcome you today. Um, family is the center of our community engagement framework. Um, this year with, the, with um, COVID-19, we begin to look at all of the things that impact families. And I come from Milwaukee from back in the Howard Fuller days where we talked about warm schools, cold schools, hot schools, coal houses, warm houses, hot houses in terms of success of kids of color. And so it's so important that families are engaged, families are given the tools and resources and the voice in the schools. Uh, I'm a proponent of big mamas in the schools. Actually, I'm writing a proposal into how to present that because having that presence um, that wisdom, um, that, 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 that kindness, uh, and that, that, that mild discipline that a big mama can give you, that a police or that a no one else can give you in within the context of our community. And, uh, and looking at black resilience is the buoyancy. It, came from, it comes from community. The HBCs are a, an example of black resilience. When we sent our kids from the South to the North to go to college and they formed communities. The church is one of those communities. And I see the library as a, per, as a place that we all can build community where families are not only engaged, um, but we are looking at their aspirations and tailoring services and, and information dissemination that it will help them become successful, uh, uh, guide them on pathways and sometimes redirect um, by knowledge, by experience, by welcoming uh, and by a, a culturally informed uh, and, and, and culturally defined and designed uh, programming. And so my team, we have been looking at uh, our work this for the last year, now we're almost we're almost in March again when the pandemic started, um, and to look at the lost learning in our in the communities of color and low income communities, it and particularly our teens, um, and so I'm excited about any opportunity that we can use the platform um, and the places and the people of the library to from a racial justice, family engagement, racial equity, social justice lens, and I am glad to be here. I can only stay to about 11.30 because I have a Juneteenth planning meeting uh, with my advisory board, but I am glad uh, to be able to participate and help facilitate today. Uh, and the library will be involved. You'll see more and hear more about how we're working with the school district, how we're working with parent groups and our partners to improve the lives of families here in Madison from a racial equity social justice lens. Um, have a good day. And I'm a, I'm a spiritual person, as you, I'm a believer. So I'll say, God bless you um, and, and, and be kind and walk in love because that is the key. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Annie. And now we're fortunate to have a uh, Chicago elder woman and community and parent organizer, uh, Jeanette Taylor with us today as our keynote speaker for this event. Elder Taylor is a longtime advocate for children and families of color on the South side of Chicago. In fact, she started that work as a parent elected to the local school council of her child's school and served in that role for 21 years, I think. She's worked as a parent organizer with the Kenwood Oakland Community Organization, and she helped organize against school closings on the south side of Chicago, including a hunger strike at Diet High School that you may have heard about. It was in the news. Um, and you may have heard her name in the news recently in her new newer role as older person in Chicago, where she's been working on COVID issues, but also helped to secure the landmark status of Emmett Till's childhood home, which is in her... Um, believes in her ward. 
We will have a question and answer period with Alder Taylor after her, she offers her remarks. So please feel free to put questions in the chat or if you hear something that resonates with you, um, please add that in as well. And at the end of her comments, then we will, we will read from those questions. So thank you so much, Alder Taylor, for being with us. Um, um, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you all for having me. Um, I don't feel like I'm in a strange place. I feel like I'm amongst friends. Um, I'll start off with saying that I was a 19 year old mother with three kids. And while my mother was on the PTA and LSC, I didn't want to do it. And so don't think this is work that you want to do because it's not. It's a lot of hours. It's a lot of time. Um, folks drove me crazy. I didn't feel like I had a life outside of this. We all know that our children consume our lives already. And then to be sitting with other teacher, parents, and community members to argue about something that you know is right was not what I wanted to do. And so don't think I stepped in this role like, yes. It was like, uh, heck no. This is not what I wanted to do. But what I realized was my child was not getting the, effort, the same education that I got. Um, I had teachers who could spend time with me. Um, I had teachers who disciplined me. Um, I had after school programs. I had everything you know, at the tip of my fingers. And then all of a sudden, because this country um, got greedy, they wanted to start to close schools in black and brown communities. And I was confused why they wanted to do that because these are schools that they never really supported. Um, my baby was using books that my name was in because I went to the same school. And so let me just tell you my history at that school. Um, Mollison Elementary was built back in the 1950s. In the 60s, it moved to its current location, which is 44th and King Drive in Chicago, which is a predominantly black community. Um, my grandmother was the first ESP. My mother was a 30 year clerk there. My aunt was a 15 year teacher there. Um, my cousins went there, I went there and my children went there. And so this was home. This was home to me. This was my home away from home. This is where I could be Jeanette and be a black child without being, uh, without apologizing for it. Um, I had teachers who looked like me, the lunch lady, the janitor. Um, we did have um, a couple of white teachers and I'll name them off just to show you how it ties in. So we had Miss Kay, um, who was my first grade teacher. I love Miss Kay. Miss Kay was the sweetest woman you ever wanted to meet. I had Miss Jackson. Miss Jackson drove me crazy, but Miss Jackson pushed me and she taught me how to sign. So I know the alphabet because she taught me how to sign. And there was Miss Rivera. Miss Rivera was my seventh grade teacher. I love math. I could do math without even thinking about it. And Miss Rivera loved me. And so I'll tell you a little funny story about why I call Miss Rivera. Um, I used to come to school early because my mother worked there. So it wasn't no, it wasn't a such thing as being late. Um, went to the school and I called Miss Rivera singing, Don't Mess with Bill which was a song by, you know, black women. And I figured out that she was singing Don't Mess With Bill because Bill was her husband's name. And so I always take that with me about Miss Rivera. Uh, it was funny just to catch her Don't Mess With Bill. It, it just tickled my heart and I always remember that. Rest in peace, Miss Rivera. And so when I became a teen mother, uh, my mother was like, I'm not gonna do that job for you. Those are your children. You need to be in the PTA and LSC. And so when I was in those spaces for the first three or four years, um, I was a yes ma'am. I thought the principal knew better. She's Although the person with the degrees. She's Although the person. Sorry. Can... Yes, but can you slow down a little for the interpreters? Okay, go Thank ahead. You. Sorry okay. to interrupt. Um, she was the person with the degrees. I thought that she knew everything. But honestly, my heart to heart told me that the decision she was making wasn't based on what the young people in our community need. They were based on what she read in that book and what the district was pushing. And so local school councils are special to Chicago. They're governing bodies because the late, the first black mayor of the city of Chicago who was here in Washington said you need local accountability to make schools work. I'm gonna say that again. 
You need local accountability to make schools work. And so while Harold Washington died and didn't get to see this come to flourishing, local school councils are basically a, a body with a principal, two teachers, two community rep, and six parents. Wanna know why six parents? Because parents have the most to lose. We drop off every day our most precious things to us and they are children. They are our children, we love them. But also understanding who spends more time with my child than me, my child's teacher. So we are co-parents. Who sees my child in the community when they go from school to home, community members. And so understanding those body of people working together to make a school community work. Fast forward to, we, they called it Renaissance 2010. Renaissance 2010 was Mayor Daly and Arnie Duncan. And so when they put around these names of special folks, call Chicago, don't believe it because the crap that they pull around this country, they do in Chicago first. So Arnie Duncan couldn't organize his way out of a wet paper bag, but somehow he became the Department of Education head, which is one of the reasons why me and President Obama don't get along. Cause I, he couldn't do nothing here. You would take him and have him destroy the country, schools all around the country, no thanks. So they came out with this plan called Renaissance 2010. And it was basically to close 20 of the 22 schools in my community. And our school was one of them. And Mollison Elementary was a family. It was not doing the best because it didn't have the resources, but it was not doing the worst because we worked together. And so Chicago has this thing of CEOs instead of educators being the superintendent. Even though we have a superintendent now that's an educator, she has lost her absolute mind. She, I, 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 I it's so much I can say about the woman, but I'm gonna be nice because I'm not sure if young people are on this call and I don't want to offend anybody. But Dr. Janice Jackson has lost her damn mind. She was an excellent teacher. She was a good principal. She became the network chief. She was losing it a little bit, but now that she is the CEO of Chicago Public Schools, she has lost her absolute mind. And I tell her every chance I get. So when they wanted to close schools in my community, I challenged the district. I said, you never gave us the books that we're supposed to have. We don't even have computers at this school. Um, you won't, you, you're not giving the school any money to purchase anything that's new for students. So how are you closing it? And so at the first meeting, because remember, I'm, this is my home away from home. I know all the parents. My mother was the clerk, so she knew all the children. Um, I knew everybody. And so our first CPS board meeting, I bought 300 students. And they were like, we don't want no problems. It's 300 of them. And so, but I also tell you a story about how it was five of us and we shut down and we went to Alderman's office and got the money we needed for resources. So don't count the numbers, but at this particular time, it was we about 300 parents and they decided not to close the schools. And so what they did was come back and figure out another plan on how to close their schools. And so what they did was use who? What are the other last stable foundations in the community? Their churches. So they use the paid black poverty pimp pastors, pay them to have people say that these schools should close. So in 2015, no, I'm sorry, 2012 was the largest school closing in United States history, which they wind up closing about 50 schools and it happened right in Chicago. But at the same time, they started opening up charter schools. So let me get this straight. We don't got money for public schools, but we can figure out how to pay private institutions to educate children who have no skin in the game. They don't know the young people. They don't come from them community. And a lot of them come from, what is the name of the, is, I'm drawing a blank, the program where no matter where you're from, teachers, uh, Teach for America. It should be Step on Teachers for America because it just, they are not, they're not people who went to school to become teachers. There are people with other degrees and they get to teach in an urban system so that they can pay off their loans. So let me get this straight. 
You went to school to be a doctor or a nurse, but because you want to pay off your loan, you get to stand in front of my, my kid for two years and you don't know what the heck you're doing. No, y'all take that somewhere else. That We don't need that here. So one of the schools that they wanted to close was a school called Diet High School. Now, Diet High School was the last open enrollment um, school and the community that I worked in and didn't live far from. And what people don't know is even before the Renaissance 2010, they were quietly closing schools in the black and brown community. What they would do was pay these folks off, tell parents it's bad, we'll give you options to go to better performing schools, and the schools were never better. They don't talk about how that's tied to youth violence in our community. They don't talk about school closings that CPS has literally lost 2,500 young people that they can't account for. They never tell you all the truth about what school closings really does. And it's not just about school, school closings. In Chicago, it was about knocking down Chicago public housing. And so when they, when they destroyed public housing that predominantly Black families lived in, they also closed schools in those communities. But what they didn't realize from, because young people were taking such good care of at schools, they would continue to come back. So young people were traveling, getting up at six and seven in the morning to travel to these schools because they love them. And so when the decision was made to close Diet High School, um, we talked to folks around the community. They didn't want to see it closed. We tried to push the, the district. We also tried to push elected officials. And now I, I am all the woman Jeanette Taylor, and I'm just going to say it for me. If you'd asked me two years ago to run for office, I'd be hell no, I'm not running for office. Elected officials in the city of Chicago, your first year, you make $100,000, you get a $3,000 raise every year, you get free dental, and you get good health insurance. About a good taxpaying folks of Chicago, and the only time you hear from them is during the election when they knocking on your door trying to get their vote. No, I don't want to be those lazies. No, they don't do nothing. But what I realized for, we, we can't wait for Superman. Those are not leaders. We, we're the leaders we've been waiting on. I was a mother that just wanted to see different for my kids. And so I ran in a race of 21 people. And I was probably the, I was the most known but I wasn't, I hadn't lived in that community for long. Um, I wasn't the most educated. I went to the neighborhood college. I graduated from high school because I had children. And so, but it was because I was honest with the constituents in the community and I didn't back down from being honest and truthful. And so out of 21 people, I was blessed to be chosen. And so, and I don't take it lightly. I'm an organizer there. So I'll go back to, to diet. So originally when they talked about a hunger strike, I was like, hell no. Not going on no hunger strike. I got a purse full of goodies and cookies. I take my snacks with me everywhere I go. I eat all. I'm waiting on my my Uber Eats right now. I eat all day long. So going on the hunger strike was. I was like, no, nah, brother G two. Uh, I'm good. I I no, nah, I can't do it. But when I realized that this system was set up to hurt young people in a way that I could never imagine it made sense to go on a hunger strike. And so of August 15, 2015, we went on a hunger strike. Um, this system has, this, this, this system agreed it has no end. It's black and brown folks today, it'll be everybody else tomorrow because all it wants is money. It cares about nothing else. So for the first nine days of the hunger strike, we had a, a media blackout. The mayor at the time, who was Rahm Emanuel, who know who everybody knows, worked for President Barack Obama. He got kicked out because he was all cocky. Nobody liked him. Um, and Barack Obama kind of ushered him into Chicago, which I will never forgive him for. Um, and he probably is one of the worst mayors in United States history. And so he had a media blockout, um, which would not cover the story. It was on day 10 that the hunger strike changed. I can't say for the better, for the worse. And so remember, I've been a healthy girl my whole life. So my body is 10 days without food and it's going crazy to the point where, you know how you watch cartoons and the cartoon character is so hungry, people start looking like hamburgers or hot dogs. That was happening to me. 
everybody was starting to look like food. I was just hungry, but I had this clarity that I, I couldn't, that was unmatched. And so the 10th day was the day that I testified at Chicago public schools meeting to say that it is 2015 and the thought that I have to go on a hunger strike for a neighborhood high school is ridiculous. I walk away from the pedestal and I pass out. Um, I'm, I'm on the ground literally. And I don't remember this day, but I remember what people tell me. So as I'm, I, I didn't fell out, they call in the ambulance. The lady who was the head of safety and security at CPS is a woman named Jadine Chow. And Jadine Chow shakes when she sees me today because she's scared I'm gonna tear her little head off. She asked them, can you just push her outside? And the folks that were with me went off. You know how you hear? It was this out of body experience where I could hear people, but I didn't know what was going on. And there was this professor that I was good friends with. Her name was Dr. Pauline Lip. And I've never heard Pauline cuss ever in my life. She was cussing and going off. And so I was taken to the hospital. And when I got there, um, the doctors were saying, you have to eat. And I was like, I'm on a hunger strike. I'm not eating. He was like, well, we're going to have a problem because you passed out. I was like, give me some water. Well, blend up some, some chicken and make some broth and put it in this IV, but I'm not eating any food. Um, and they told me um, that it wasn't good for me to be on this hunger strike because of my weight. Um, and my oldest- You have goggles, right? Time, Maybe bring your goggles, passed, girls. She, um, she called me and said, baby, that city is going to let you die. You got to get off the hunger strike. Uh, my daughter, who was in eighth grade, if this school wouldn't have opened, would have had, had to travel about eight miles to go to school, which means she would have to get up at five and get up at six, said to me, I'll go to whatever school you want me to. Just get off the hunger strike. I, we can't lose you. At the same time, I had decided what was going to be my sacrifice for the young people in my community. They've already taken away their housing. They have already taken away the after school programs. The kids had diet had won the ESPN grant to get a, a, a million dollar gym. They couldn't use the gym equipment. They wouldn't allow them to swim. They wouldn't. And so it was like, I was at the fork in the road of my life and I had to choose whether I was gonna stay or get off. Um, at the time I was married to a man in Ghana who had called everybody, including my boss. It was like, she's off the hunger strike. And ultimately, we wind up getting a divorce because of it, but I had to choose for me. And I chose young people. I chose the people in my community. I chose to stand up and do what was right. And so I stayed on that hunger strike for 30 days. Um, everybody else did 34 days. Um, I got off at 30 because at the 30th day, my first and only grandchild was born. And so I wanted to be alive to, and I call her Nana's Banana. Um, I wanted to be alive to, to make sure that she got what she needed. Um, I wanted to be around to make sure that I could fight for more schools. And so during the hunger strike, I just saw the city do some evil stuff. They said they delivered food to the site where we were on a hunger strike. They would send people to fight with us. We would stand in front of diet every day. They would barbecue right down from us so we could smell the food. It was just a really bad thing. And so after the hunger strike, I, I stopped. I didn't want to organize anymore. I was like, this system is evil. It will eat you up. The city that I pay taxes to, the city that I love and adore and won't be anywhere else hates yeah. me and hates, yeah. hates people that look like me. And so I didn't want to organize. And so for like two and a half months, I didn't go to any meetings. I didn't, I wasn't working at the organization, which big shout out to Coco. That's why I'm born and bred it. That's what gave me my organizing skills and feet. But I didn't, I didn't want to organize anymore because it hurt. I, I just couldn't believe a system in a city that I love was attacking me in a way that I couldn't believe. And so after two months, um, I had maybe three years ago, I had moved to a community called Woodlawn. And it was because the community where Mollison was, was being gentrified. And my mother, who was the CPS clerk, and myself, who was an organizer, couldn't afford to live in our community anymore. 
And so we were forced out basically. And what happened was anytime big development comes to a community, the first set of people that they push out are low income and working families and they're usually back and brown. And so me and my family had to move. And so we moved to Woodlawn. Two months after the hunger strike, we get the announcement that they're going to build the Obama Presidential Center in my community. And I knew exactly what was gonna happen. They were going to push us out of that community and I wasn't gonna have it. And so we started talking about having a community benefits agreement and they've done them around the country, which means if this large establishment comes, then we wanna make sure that the people in the community aren't displaced that they have access to the jobs and that they're able to get money to help create businesses and keep their homes. And so basically I had to, we fought with the Obama Foundation about it to the point where the Obama Foundation had a meeting. It was at the McCormick Place, which is in Chicago and you had to stand in line to get a seat. And so we know the city's tricks. Um, so we had, we spent the night overnight I wound up couldn't spend a night because my mother had a major stroke. And so I was at the hospital and was like, I got to get to this meeting. That was a bit between making sure that she was alive and coming to this meeting. I was like, I got to get to the meeting. I got to ask the foundation, can we have a community benefits agreement? Because not only was me and my mother going to be forced to move, hundreds and thousands of people that lived in my community was. And it's a community where the median income is $25,000. And so you are already not paying a bill a month or you don't pay a bill to buy food or you're not paying a bill to buy shoes that was already struggling. And I just wasn't gonna allow him. And I'll tell you all this, I don't care if it's the first black president, I don't care if it's Queen Elizabeth, I don't care if it's Beyonce. Unchecked power is dangerous. And when people have the power to do right by you and they don't, you challenge them. I don't care who they are. And so I got a lot of flack for challenging the first black president because I asked him why not a community benefits agreement? Make sure that we can stay. And he went into, oh, I was a community organizer and I was this and then he opened his mouth to say no. He said, if we sign the community benefits agreement there'll be people coming out the woodworks that want us to sign. And I was thinking, COCO is a 50 year old organization that was, that was started by Reverend Jesse Jackson, along with other pastors and community leaders, who just came into the picture. No, 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 Barack. You don't get to talk to me like that. And y'all know the most dangerous thing is to tell a woman, no, no. You said no to this woman? That, that's not how women operate. And it ain't just black women, it's all of us. It's like, underestimate me so I can show you. And that's exactly what happened. They underestimated a black woman from a, a low income and working community. And I basically, we got something that's close to a community benefits agreement. Um, he is the reason why, and I'll have a chance very soon to thank him um, because he's the reason why I ran for office. He, he is the reason why I ran. You don't tell me no, especially when I know I'm right. And so for me, I got into the race, 21 people, I got to the runoff and I'll, I'll mention that in January of 2019, I lost my mother. So in the middle of the election, my mother died. And so my mother was everything. My mother is the reason why I was at the local school council. My mother was the reason why, and you know, you go through this phase and I'm just, we're family. So I'm gonna be honest. You go through the phase where you don't wanna be like your mother. So I worked in retail my whole life because I wanted nothing to do with CPS. And I was the black widow of, of retail. So I worked for Ventures, it closed. I worked for Kmart, it closed. I worked at TJ Maxx and I wound up quitting because the manager didn't understand that because I have an autistic son, Michael, who is now 16, that I needed to take off because we wasn't sure at the time what was going on with Michael. You know, autistic was a new word. And so we really didn't know what it was, but he was giving me problems about taking off, so I quit. Then I worked for Linens and things and it closed. So I was like, what am I supposed to be doing, God? And he was like, go to the schools. And so I, be, I, I met Brother G2 Brown at a local school council training. Um, they liked me so much, they, I volunteered because I loved it. And I also should thank Obama in another way. Remember when Obama first got into office and he had the Say Yes program and it offered 
community organizations who hired everyday people a credit if they hired people who wasn't in the organization. Coco wind up hiring me for the summer and I stayed. And so I should double thank President Obama for his willingness to give me an office. Fast forward to, I win this race. I'm shocked number one, because my thing was, I never thought I was going to win. Just because there were more educated folks in there, there were people who were, had lived in the community since they were born. I just didn't think I had a chance. But I got that chance because I didn't apologize for who I was and I was honest with the constituents in the community. And so they respected that. And so when I got into the space, my first fight was to keep my promise. And so what I promised the community was, I would give them a seat at the table. And so there is not a move or a decision that I make without my community. My community decides what development looks like. We have these things in the, in the city called TIFFs. Um, they are tax increment finance, where there are money that goes into a pot in each community from the property taxes paid that is supposed to go for development. We don't spend it in this ward unless the community says so. There is just the thing that Shirley Chisholm says that your, 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 your due on this earth, the rent you pay on earth is service to others. And so my promise to my community, I go back now, I haven't knocked doors since COVID because I don't want nobody COVID and I don't want to give it to nobody. But I'm calling my community. They're at the table and they're not used to this. They get to vote on projects. Um, you know, we got the first black mayor in the city of Chicago. Um, I've had to challenge her and I'm okay with it. Don't make me a difference. Unchecked power is how 45 was able to corrupt our country. I'm just going to say that. And so she's no different. And so if you Google little old Jeanette Taylor, you'll see I'm I, 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 I defund the police. The police don't make us safe. There has to be a real conversation about what safety looks like um, in our communities. Um, I'm part of a group that wants to take SROs. They call, them, um, they call them resource officers, but they're really police that are in the school. Young people see police around the community. They don't need to send them in the school. And the best schools in the city of Chicago don't have police in them. They only in the poor neighborhoods and black and brown communities. So I'm against that that's in our communities. I'm fighting that. I'm fighting so many fights. Um, there is now a hunger strike here around a, a company called General Iron who was kicked out of one community that was a well-off community. Now they want to move in a poor community and it's just okay because those people are poor. It's not okay. Uh, we're fighting for community control of the police. The city of Chicago sends 40% of its city budget on police. That's more than they spend for education. That's more than they spend for housing. That's more than they spend for public health and mental health. It's a no for me. I need for us to get in the mindset of, and I'm also, I will say, I'm a democratic socialist of America because, and to me, what that basically means is public power. There is no way that we work hard to fill these taxes in and we keep this country going and we don't have a say so. It's a no. It's, we can't operate like that anymore. We, we, we just can't. We got to be in a space where every day mothers and fathers are able to make the decision. And we don't need no leaders. Ella Baker said it better than anybody. Strong people don't need no strong leaders. I was just a mama who wanted to see better for my kids. And look where I am. Would I tell somebody to take this route? Probably not. But I say my life's turned out pretty well. I'm in a good place. And I ain't talking about monetarily. I'm talking about being able to go to a school that they were going to close, that they now invested $14 million in. Going to a community where the community decides what these store owners are going to do and not do in my community. Making sure that the people in the community who too often are voiceless actually get to be heard. And so I'm blessed and honored to be in this space. Um, I'm not going to be here for a long time. And I'll tell you why, because young people need to take this over. If there's a mistake that this country has made, it's not listening to young people. And it's why we keep getting it wrong. This generation ain't lost, it's been neglected. We've gotten comfortable. In the 80s and 90s, we got comfortable, thought that we got rid of Reaganomics, 
the war on drugs was over, and we allowed people to get in these offices and make policies that hurt one set of folks and help another. This country can no longer run in that. And I'll say this about schools and I'll stop and we can go to Q&A. In Finland, they have a saying, you get the school ready for the child, not the child ready for the school. And until public education in the United States and in Milwaukee and in Chicago and in Pittsburgh and in Philadelphia and everybody else is that way, we got some fighting to do y'all. Thank y'all for listening. Thank you so much. I wish you could hear all the applause that I know is happening right now. I see um, the hands. Thank you all. Yeah. Um, I think we'll probably have a bunch of questions right now. Folks, put your questions into the chat. Um, and Maxine McKinney to Royston will lift those up and read them out so that our interpreters um, can also share the questions for folks in the interpretation room. Um, and you also feel free to put things that uh, you appreciated or resonated with you in the chat too for Alderwoman Taylor. All right. So we already have a question if I can lift it up, Erica. Please do. So organizer Taylor, the first question that we have from Nicole Louie is in your dream world, what would community control of schools look like? It would be LSCs in every school that actually, LSCs around the country. That's privy to Chicago, it doesn't happen anywhere else. And so if you have that local accountability where you got the principal, you got teacher voice, you got um, community members and you have parents and young people. I forgot to say in high schools, there are two young people who are on it and they need to be in elementary schools as well. If those body of folks come together in every school and disguise what the school community look like, we will have public education that you just, where young people will love and thrive and want to go to school, period. That, that it, and this is the thing, we ain't got to reinvent the wheel. We know what good schools look like. They just not a priority in certain communities. They're just not. And so local school councils is what we need around this country, period, that are controlled by the people, not the principal. At Mollison Elementary, you can Google us. The principal is a member of the local school council. She doesn't run anything. Because remember, and I say this to teachers, and I love teachers. I listen, every year I send teachers a message in August to say, your child, and I'm usually talking about my kid, he found cartoon porn, he almost burned down my kitchen, he drove me nuts, he expected me to cook. If it's Tide Pods, if it's a refrigerator, if it's a washing and dryer, if it's paper, whatever you need, but you're getting your kid back in September because I appreciate teachers, but we also have to have parent voice. Think about this. If none of us decide to take our children to school, who will get paid? I'll wait. And I ain't got on the watch, nobody. And so know the power of your parents in your school. I'm not in this position because there were not teachers who didn't educate me. Teachers came and showed me how to do IEPs. I go to IEPs, I still do that. I'm a local school council facilitator. I train local school councils. And that is because teachers and community members made sure I got those tools. Don't sleep on parents. See, I can say a whole bunch of stuff a parent and a teacher can't say. Like the people who work at the, at the downtown building are idiots. Y'all know what y'all talking about. You know what you're doing. I'm not asking the teacher to do that because you can't come live with me. I already got five kids, a grandbaby, a cat, and a partridge in a pear tree. You can't come live with me. So I'm not gonna ask you to lose your job, but I will stand up for you especially when I know you love my kids, especially when I know you staying after school, especially when I know you spending your money to buy supplies because the district won't give it to you, especially when you tell me what's going on, when the school try to make it all rosy and clear, I'll fight for you every chance I get. And so local school councils are needed. Thank you for speaking to local school councils. There's a lot of a lively chat going on about what local school councils are. People are responding to those questions. So if you have questions about that, I invite you all to read the chat. Um, Organizer Taylor, a second question that we have from Jeremy is how would you recommend deciding which things to prioritize first when you're fighting for more equitable schooling? That's a conversation you have with your school community. That's the problem. And see, I say it as an elected official and I say it as an adult. Think about this, we'll say, oh, we're gonna build a community center for young people and it's gonna have this, 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 and this. And then when the young people don't come, 
We like, why didn't they come? This was a great idea because we so busy making a decision for them, we don't listen. They need to be at the table to help us decide. And don't give me that, oh, they young, they don't know. No. Fred Hampton was 21 years old before they killed him. Martin Luther King wasn't for it. Young people have changed this country time and time over and over again. And so it's getting everybody at the table to ask the hard questions. And it's a tool that we use in organizing called a listening session. You ask three questions and you listen. Ain't no room for rebuttal. Ain't no but wait or I did. And what we did in our school was we had the principal, a couple of teachers, parents to listen to what young people had to say. And young people told us what the priority, the, the lunch is nasty. We don't have enough time for prep. They wanted to make sure they had a librarian. They wanted to have a, they wanted to learn Spanish throughout the school. Your, your community can do that. It's hard because we're taught to fight against each other. We used to be taught that teachers feel like they better than parents and that's why they don't listen. We ain't got time out for that. If the pandemic ain't taught us nothing, it has taught us that we ain't got time to worry about whether I like you or not. I ain't never got to like you. We have to work together because our young people and this generation deserves it. And so it's asking the questions, it's organizing around it. It's having those hard conversations about race. People talk about Chicago all the time that black and brown people don't work together. That's a lie. The diet hunger strike would not happen without the little village hunger strikers. And the little village hunger strikers were mothers, Latinx mothers and fathers who went on a hunger strike for only 19 days from a school that they got, guess what y'all, a school built from the ground up. We learn from them. We ain't got time to worry about what, and this is one of the things that I struggle with when it came to them electing our mayor. They was like, she's the first open gay woman. Who you sleep with and how you live your life ain't my business. Are you gonna roll up your sleeves and do this work with me? That's what I care about. So I don't care about your color. I don't care where you came from. I don't care what your shoes cost. None of that matters to me. What matters is that we're working together for the better good of humanity. Because what we do in the United States, they multiply around this country. Beautiful, thank you. I have a reaction from a young person in my household who doesn't want to be in camera. And she wanted <laughs> us to know that if we want to hear feedback, we need to hear it from the children. And if we want to look at what change is going to be, we need to look at who's at the table. Absolutely. So the next questions I want to lift up are two that are kind of connected. Um, one of them is around, how do we get the school superintendent to have action, not just words? And then a kind of related question, which is around um, teachers being afraid to talk to black and brown parents. And how do you change the narrative? So, Chicago is the only, and I didn't mention this, but I will, is the only school district in the state of Illinois with an appointed school board. I'm gonna say that again. There are 300 school districts and only school district 299 has an appointed school board. Wanna know why? Because it's the only school district in the state of Illinois that has the majority of black and Latinx students. And so if y'all got the, 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 if you all have the power to control the superintendent, fire him on his day off. He does not get an opportunity to sit in that seat because he making millions of dollars. And I ain't just talking about his salary, I'm talking about his paybacks from when he purchased certain computers, when they buy certain books from certain companies. Now, I'm just telling y'all, because I know the game. I've been on the local school council for 22 years, but I've been organizing through those times and I've learned the playbook. And so people that you all elect, if they don't serve y'all, get them out of there. Find one of your own, find one of your teachers, find one of your parents, get them in that seat. They need to go. Teachers who don't talk, can you repeat the question? It was about uh, teachers who are afraid to talk to or listen to black and brown parents. You in the wrong job, you in the wrong business, especially if those are young people that you are serving, you are at the wrong job. Don't be a, what, what does a Latinx mother and an Asian mother and a white woman want, a white mother want different than a black mother wants? Nothing, we want the exact same things. So there is no reason. And especially if you have my child. So if you're scared to talk to me, are you scared to talk to my child? I'm concerned about that. I, I'm very concerned. Talking about race is very hard because we don't wanna offend people. I understand it all day. 
but I have do not have to, to dumb down myself to make you comfortable. I don't. So as, a, as being a black woman, there is so much that I could teach you about my culture, but there's also so much I can learn from you. Don't be afraid. You got into this profession. I hope you did because teachers don't make that much. In Chicago, a new teacher makes what? Maybe 80000 a year? They don't make much. So you mean to tell me $80,000 and I'm dealing with 30 kids. So I'll just speak for Jeanette. I got five kids. They probably all got 20 different personalities. They all want something different. So you got 30 kids. Because in Chicago, they let you put 30 kids, 30, 35 kids in the classroom. So you got 30 kids with 30 different personalities. You teaching multiple subjects and you ain't got parents in your room. It's why you going crazy. Invite those parents. This is something that I tell teachers. So in Chicago, we have these things called PDs and they're at the beginning of the year. Every school district has them. And it's a week before school start or two weeks where teachers get together. As a local school council member, because I had it together, I was invited. And the first thing I tell teachers is, make sure that you call every child's parent. I don't got time for that. I got to put my board together. I got to do this. Yes, you do. You talk to every parent. Why? Because it does three things. You built that relationship. because so your child can't never call me and say, you know, mama, Miss Lake cussed me out. What was you doing when Miss Lake cussed you out? Miss Lake hit me. You did something because Miss Lake ain't hit you for no reason. If I don't, if I have time, I will come into your classroom and volunteer and help you with those young people that are struggling. Help you uh, get copies of papers. Help you with books. Help take young people. See, we don't see the relationship as for what it is. It's a working relationship that's helping to build a strong adult. It's why young people are so broken because they see us going back and forth with each other. I don't got time for that. I, I don't got time for that. What I got time for is me and you working together. And it ain't about us agreeing about politics because that ain't it. It's about us being in a relationship and you being able to say to me, you know, I got a student that's acting out. Is something going on at home and I don't understand. Can you talk to the parent? Of course, I got a relationship with that parent. That parent be able to tell you, this was going on in their house. This was going on. This was going on in this house. Let's take them down to the clerk to get that child some help. Let's find the community organization that's in the community that can help them. Schools are the last stable foundations that we have in our communities. And because of these folks who couldn't organize out their way out of wet paper bag, they in chaos. But we can't allow them. We got to work together. We ain't enemies. You went to school to get that degree. I'm happy for you. I don't want to be nobody teacher. No, thanks. Don't want your job. It's why I love y'all so much because that ain't what I want. But at the end of the day, know that when my child is not with you, my child is with me. And so my work, I enhance your work and your job. I help you in it. And that's how we got to see it. See, the district has done a great job at teaching you that, oh, don't listen to them parents. Them parents don't know better. They ain't nobody. They ain't smarter than you. And who has that help? that system, it ain't helped that teacher, it ain't helped that parent, and that daggone show ain't helped the child who we supposed to be educating. Thank you for lifting up the importance of relationships, of schools, of paying teachers what they deserve and what we should be advocating for teachers to actually be thinking about in their work as human development professionals and the role of parents. Um, our friend here has decided to join in the conversation and has a comment and a question. And I think that okay. will probably be the one we end with. Okay. I just wanted to say it. Um, what I just wanted to say is that um, sometimes kids can't talk to you exactly because they feel like you won't understand. So if you want to get something, you want to get someone's feedback or from a children's perspective, you want to have one child talk to another child about everything else on that topic. And my question was, um, it's if, why do children have to hide in their classroom if they're supposed to be engaging? Why do children, children have to do what? Um, why do we, children look most for places to hide in a classroom instead of people to engage with? That's a question you don't have to answer for me. I don't know why young people hide, but I get why young people don't, don't talk to us 
because they don't think we listening. And because when you tell us stuff, we honestly think we know better than you. And honestly, we don't. We, we honestly don't. You can tell me more about your school and your community and what you think in your field than somebody who went to school and read a book about it. I need you, but we've made the mistake of not listening to young people, which is why we continue to get it wrong and we can't afford to do that anymore. So I thank you for speaking up. I thank you for talking to your peers, but we need you. We, we will never know what the real issue is if you don't talk to me and tell me. And it ain't you directly have to talk to me, write it on a piece of paper. We had these things in Mollison that was suggestion box. You didn't have to write your name on them. If you knew another kid that was getting hurt or it was something on your mind, you could just put it in a box. And after school every day, a parent, a teacher and a principal would read those. And we would realize a lot of the issues that were going on in the school lately, They a lot of them started on social media, which remember, we were still on MySpace. We wasn't on Facebook. We took it on Facebook now and they're on something different. But that's how we realized a lot of the stuff that was going on in the community because young people told us. And so never stop using your voice. Even when you're afraid, write it on a sticky note. I see all your sticky notes behind you. Tell it to your friend. Write it down. Type it on the computer. Somebody somewhere is listening. And I just, I thank young people like you. And challenge us. We ain't always right. We don't know. I was in your shoes once. A long time ago, wasn't no Snapchat, wasn't no Instagram, wasn't no none of that. I was outside jumping rope and eating because that's what I did. Eating snowballs and playing jacks and hula hooping. See, y'all don't do that. That's, that's what we used to do. And so we're, it's different. You got to teach us because we don't know. But in you teaching us, don't think that it's you're hurting your generation or you snitching, as they say. You're actually helping us to understand how we support you and how we help you. Beautiful, thank you. Erica? Thank you so much, Alderwoman Taylor. We're, we're giving you snaps, we're giving you claps. Thank you. Um, thank even you. behind all the muting. It's been really powerful and I love the lifting up of student youth voices in addition to families and the relationships. It's, it's really, thank you so much. I'm always open to talk because we're not gonna fix this because it didn't take overnight for it to, to blow up. It took a long time for them to get this system. It's gonna take all of us working together to fix it. And so I'm always open to answering questions, helping out in whatever way I can. I mean, that's, that is amazing. So thank you for that. Well, we'll be in touch um, and we're gonna take a little break now. We're gonna let you know, and we're also in your, in, in thanks for your, coming to speak with us today, making a donation to um, an organization that you've been working with. I'm not sure if it's Coco or whom, but you'll let us know, I know, right? So thank yeah, you Yeah, it's so some much. organization. And that's another thing, I do these engagements, I never take the money, I always donate it. Cause that's the right thing to do. These organizations need the money, it's good. And so, but I appreciate, I would have done this for free. Um, I did some work with MTA a couple of years ago. So actually they, 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 I drove down and talked to the teachers before they were gone strike. And they come to Chicago a couple of times. So I'm always appreciative of parents and teachers. You all have me. If you could get on my schedule, you know how to get in touch with my chief of staff. I'm always open to doing these. All right. Thank you so much. We're going to.